And um, with that, I think that we will get started. Especially since Hattie's here, she can keep letting people in. Um, so welcome everybody to tonight's class. This is the third in our um, five-week series, five-week beginning vegetable gardener series. And um, just a reminder for everybody who's on, if you could just please mute yourselves so we don't distract the speaker and the rest of the class. Um, so tonight our class is on soils and composting and it is taught by uh, Master Gardener Frank Branham, who's been a Master Gardener since 2017. Many of you from Flagstaff may know Frank as the owner and chef of the Cottage Place, which he operated for um, 22 years. And Frank has been teaching um, classes around Flagstaff for a long time. And um, for those of you who've been around Flagstaff, you might remember Frank teaching cooking classes at the Season Kitchen. And I actually was one of his students back then. Um, also, since he's become a master gardener, he has taught uh, a class on um, cooking from your garden, which was a really fun class that we had at the Cooperative Extension Office two years ago. And Frank and I were trying to remember if it was last year or if it was the year before, because we've all lost a year due to COVID, but it was, uh, two years ago that he um, taught that class. So um, with that, just a couple of housekeeping notes. So Frank asked me to put a couple of links in the chat box. And I did that um, before the class because I'm going to be sharing this, my screen. So getting to the chat is gonna be hard for me during Frank's talk, but he really wanted to share with you a couple of resources. The first one is the Soil Texture by Feel Key. And Frank is going to be just briefly referring to the Soil um, Texture by Feel test that you can do at home. So the directions for doing that, you can find that in the chat box. Also, Frank is going to be talking about the Soil Jar Test. So um, that's gonna be the second link in the chat box. So if you like to try either one of those tests at home on your own, um, Frank's just going to mention them. He's not going to go into uh, a lot of detail about them. So um, we have those resources for you in the chat um, to explore and uh, and do it on your own at home. So with that, I- So Gail, yeah. um, so I'll look at the chat, okay? Oh. And, and for you, and a couple of people are looking for the links. You haven't put the links in yet, have you? Uh, I put them in there before the class. Okay, I, I, I don't- I'm not seeing them either. And people are saying they can't see the links. Okay. We have to redo that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we can do that. Or if Hattie, if you know of like good sites that you can, I had one was Clemson and then the other one, I can't remember. I just pulled it off, but um, maybe after the talk, if we haven't figured it out yet, I'll pull up the chat and I will do that. I'll put in um, Colorado States. Okay, cool. In a couple minutes, folks, I have to go find it. Okay. <laughs> it's all yours, Frank. Oh, okay. Oh, great. All right. Uh, can I get the next slide? So stop treating your soil like dirt. Uh, this call to action from soil ecologists is about trying to save the world's soil. We're losing a lot of soil to erosion, uh, pesticides, drought, and mechanical tilling. And though their call is, you know, about policy and and farmers changing how they do business there. What they're suggesting is really helpful for independent little gardeners like us and home gardeners. So soil is the top layer of the earth's surface. It's a complex mix of minerals, organic matter, water, air, and living organisms. And it serves the growth medium for land plants. Soil is constantly evolving due to water and the activity of microorganisms. Uh, soil is a larger reservoir of carbon than all the forests on earth. Um, and then dirt, well, dirt's what you get on your clothes when you work in the soil. Can I get the next slide? So some of their organisms and their recommendations, basically we want to treat our soil like a living organism. First of all, the soil is home to billions of microorganisms and worms and insects. Most of those are beneficial and by feeding it organic matter, we're going to encourage more uh, soil organisms 
and those soil organisms break down uh, both the organic matter and inorganic matter and help make it more uh, accessible to plants. They also sometimes can, that process can help suppress uh, soil borne uh, diseases. We also want to keep it covered and moist. In Arizona, our soil, we have such hot, dry days. We went like three months last year with about a 6% humidity that the soil dries out and it breaks down the organic matter. So if you're adding a lot of organic matter, but you don't keep your soil covered with mulch or cover crops, it tends to break down very fast. Uh, I use pine straw for mulch. It's plentiful and it don't have to carry it very far. And then cover crops are plants that you plant specifically to help improve the soil. And even if they die, they become mulch. And then don't overwork it. So low till gardening, you've heard of no, no till farming. Um, if we break it up too much, we can damage the um, networks and, and damage the soil and make it more compacted. Um, next slide. A single teaspoon of healthy soil contains more microorganisms organisms than there are people on earth. So there's lots of soil organisms and they're mostly beneficial, play a vital role in our gardening. Next slide. So let's take a little bit bigger look at soil. First of all, the thing that surprised me when I first heard this was that soil has open spaces because at that point my soil was so compacted, I didn't really couldn't imagine there being a lot of open spaces. But about half of the, in healthy soil, about half of the soil is open spaces. And about half of that, 25% of the total, uh, will be filled with water and 25% with air. Out of the remaining half, mostly it's mineral, about 45% of the total. And when we talk about mineral, um, it's gonna be um, a broken down from the mother material that's in your area. So in my area, it's limestone. So I get a lot of you know, ground up limestone in my soil. Um, in different parts of town, there will be other uh, mineral components. And when we talk about sand, silt, and clay, those refer to the size of the particles, not what they're made of necessarily. And we're going to talk about that more in our, um, when we get into the soil texture. Organic matter, about 5% is pretty healthy. I probably try to have more than that. Um, it's both living and dead um, organic matter. Then microorganisms, they don't really have a space on the pie chart because they're sort of spread throughout everything. Earthworms, fungi, bacteria, nematodes, mites, protozoa, amoebas, and they do a lot of good things for our soil and we'd like to encourage them to stay alive. Next slide. So how do we have open spaces in the soil? Well, the process um, through the microorganisms and some chemical properties of the soil particles and the soil is formed into aggregates. These are small clumps of mineral and organic matter bound together by proteins exuded by the microorganisms and um, fungi, fungal hyphae, which are like a little thread-like things that help hold them together. And they're semi-waterproof from these uh, organic uh, glue-like substances. Uh, they are more fragile when they're wet. They can be crushed by compacting or tilling the soil. So the lesson is don't work your soil too hard. If you look at this um, pile of my garden soil, you'll see some big clumps and those will fall apart pretty easily. And out around the edges, you'll see smaller clumps. Those are actual aggregates. And probably the dusty stuff up in the left-hand corner is probably more individual particles. Uh, next slide. So the soil aggregates basically stack together to make the soil structure. This is actually a pile of rocks on a piece of paper, but that's sort of how you can see how the aggregates piled together, leave open spaces that allow water, air, and plant roots to pass through. Um, next, next slide. This is a diagram of some soil uh, structures. The one we want is the one up in the left-hand corner, kind of granular, um, like cookie crumbs, 0.5 centimeter little crumbs of soil and you know, you hear that you want your soil to be crumbly. Um, down in the, the platy structures, most of the others are not very good examples, um, is probably a pretty compacted soil, maybe a heavy in clay. And then in the bottom right is uh, individual grains. And we get that a lot with sand. And then if, when my soil dries out, it's heavy in silt, it's just like dust. It just would, it breaks down into individual part, particles. Uh, next slide. 
soil organic organic matter um basically the part of the soil that consists of plant material and you know it could be some ancient animals but nothing probably current that is processed and decomposing in the process of decomposing and it's fully decomposed it's called hummus hummus is um, a very important soil structure holds individual mineral particles together hummus is organic is very highly broken down organic matter hummus is a dip made from garbanzo beans and tahini um, there's none of that in the soil um, the some of few things about the soil struct uh, the organic matter in the soil really aids in the formation of the soil structure reduces soil compaction if if your soil is um, been worked in the past and it has pretty good structure then you're wanting to try to maintain that if you're starting you know a new bed in our area you might have some pretty hard work to dig it you might really have to break it up and um, while the soil and once you add organic matter that will help keep it from compacting again it helps increase water infiltration and um, clay soils and the water holding capacity in sandy soils um, it'll increase micro microbial activity because they eat the the organic matter and the more that there is the more they eat the more they reproduce the, the more you'll have uh, provides a source of nutrients and can help sustain those nutrients next slide adding organic amendments there are a lot of different theories um i'm on the high side of adding organic matter but a good way to go is to add four inches of organic matter you might want to dig it in depending on where your soil is at in its uh, evolution um, you want to, have to keep adding it every year because it breaks down and it breaks down worse in arizona than it would in a lot of places you can add too much but probably not too likely in our area because it breaks down so fast and you'd want to have between 2% and 5% um, organic matter in your bed. Um, and then uh, if your soil is already in pretty good shape and your topsoil at least has pretty good structure, you can do a technique called double dig, no, double digging. And it's a gentle way to work the soil. And um, there's a, a pattern to it, but basically you remove the top layer of soil, reserve that, and then you use a garden fork or a shovel to break up the next layer of soil and which goes down like another foot maybe eight inches to another foot and then you add your organic matter so it can uh, seep into the lower levels then you put the top soil back on top and hopefully you haven't broken up the aggregates too badly next slide uh, this is a cycle for you know typical cycle of how people might add organic matter you start in the fall and of course we're past fall um if you um, start in the fall adding compost and other organic material then it has all winter to break down and to work into your and, and to work into the garden um, i actually add organic matter all through the year i will add compost in the fall but i'm a little too tired to dig it in right then so i put it on top and i put mulch on top of it that's about the time the pine needles fall and then come in the spring i would scrape off the pine needles and I'll start digging that organic matter in. I'll probably add more organic matter. It's also a good time to add a balanced fertilizer because then the fertilizer and sulfur would have like a month or so to break down um, before you do your planting. And then once I plant, I go back and I put another layer of compost on top of the soil and I put um, mulch on top of that. Um, next slide. And let's get into that thing about soil texture. And so we're talking about different size particles. Um, so sand is based on the size of the particle. Could be not necessarily silicate sand. Could be from limestone. Could be from granite. Um, could be from basalt. Um, and it's we're talking about particles of about two millimeters down to about 0.05 millimeters. So what we would probably think of as a grain of sand. However, um, anything bigger than that is considered a rock, I guess. Um, silt is uh, a little bit too small to see from with the uh, naked eye, and there's the medium-sized particles. And then clay are super fine particles that you need a microscope to see. The sand will fill, if you do that uh, uh, texture test with your hand where you just moisten some of your soil and you rub it between your fingers, the sand will feel gritty. The soil will feel uh, smooth. The silt will feel smooth, um, but not sticky. And it's kind of flowery when it's dry. 
and clay will feel, feel really uh, slippery, but it will also stick together and it will mold, it's more moldable. Um, and so next slide. So once you figure out what the, uh, your percentages of the kinds of uh, soil particles that you have, these textures are included into classes. And this has to do with the percentage of sand, silt, and loam that you have. And the next slide we're actually going to show you will have the test. But 40% um, sand, 40% silt, 20% clay is called loam. And that's kind of the best of both all the worlds because the sand helps with drainage, the silt helps hold it together and make aggregates, and the clay also helps stick it together. So, you, you know, and you get drainage where if you have higher. And then there's different levels. Um, you know, we have silt loam, which is loam with a higher percentage of silt and sandy loam that has a higher percentage of sand or clay loam. And it keeps going out until, you know, if you have pure sand, you have a real challenge on your hand. If you have pure clay, which somebody, I guess, sent up and had a question in the chat. Well, you need to add a lot of organic matter and possibly some sand or something to try to break it up. Next slide. So don't take time to read this. Basically, this is the jar test that we're going to give you in the chat. Pretty much your uh, um, you're going to clean out all the debris, rocks, trash. You're going to crush the soil, and um, then you're going to put it in a, a jar with a, a non-foaming dishwasher and um, dishwashing detergent. Shake it for like 10 or 15 minutes, and then when you let it settle, it's going to um, settle into the various layers. Um, it takes a couple of days for this clay to settle out. Next slide. Um, so then you would get kind of your, and you can measure the layers and you can figure out what your percentage is. And then you can go back to the uh, soil, tri the texture triangle and see where you're at. And yes, I saw a question come up in the chat that said, well, I remove the pine needles. Yes, I definitely remove the pine needles. I do then put them in a compost pile, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, but I hate having whole pine needles in my beds. It's really hard to put a shovel through them. Uh, next slide. And then soil testing. So this guy's using a, a special device, but mostly we just dig a hole and then take a, a slice of the soil off the side of it. You can have your soil tested for all these different nutrients as well as micronutrients. Standard test will give you, you know, the top five most, pop, most common nutrients that people are concerned about, but you can also pay extra for a test that will do micronutrients. And one of the most important things is it's going to show you um, the pH. Next slide. So pH is a scale we use to measure the difference between acidity and alkalinity of a soil or a solution. And it's a 14 point or 14 unit scale and one being the most acidic and 14 being the most alkaline. And each of these units is uh, goes up logarithmically. So each unit will go up 10 times. So if you have a um, soil pH of six, that's 10 times more acidic than a soil pH of seven. And plant growth mostly takes place between like four and 10. And um, plant growth, um, well, so, you know, like blueberries like, like a 4.5, they like a really acidic soil. Most plants like between a six and a seven. I've heard that tomatoes are best at about 6.8. Um, asparagus likes a more alkaline soil, like maybe 7.5 or so. And you know, potatoes like a little bit more acidic soil. So I think most books will say it's 5.5 to 6.5 or something. But you can almost, well, seed packets may give you a preferred pH. And certainly any basic gardening book will give you, you know, some, a pH range for each of the plants. Um, I like the Vegetable Gardener's Bible, but there's lots of different ones to choose from. Next slide. Uh, soil pH that's optimal for most plants. We kind of already covered that. The other thing I didn't mention is that the native soil in northern Arizona is about an 8.2. So you're probably going to want to think you need to figure out or you need to get some kind of a test to let you know for sure where you're at. Um, I am doing some home testing that I'm pretty confident with. It's a kind of an expensive test kit. It's about 90 bucks. I think it went up $30 because of COVID. Um, but um, most people say that any home test is not that accurate. At least be good to send soil off for a test at least once, um, but there's a good chance that you're going to want to um, 
add some soil sulfur to adjust your soil, but you need to find out where you're at to start with. Um, interestingly enough, I, I like this brand of soil amendments, Kellogg's, I've used it a lot, but a couple of their products have lime in them and lime is what you would use if your soil is on the acidic side. So whatever, you know, soil amendments you buy, you want to be sure and read the label and see uh, they, they actually do include pretty good ingredients. Um, and so you wouldn't want to be adding lime to your soil here unless you're in an unusual area. Next slide. These are some uh, somewhat inexpensive soil tests. I like Peaceful Valley Farm Supply, uh, GrowOrganic.com. I think that they and they have videos on how to take a soil sample and they do so, uh, soil sampling for you um, and they get it back quickly and they'll give you an analysis will come up on your computer. It's really pretty effective. Haven't used the other two, um, but I think that they're relatively uh, reasonably priced compared to other things. And um, we're going to go keep going, but if you need us to, we can put this in the chat later. Next slide. So what uh, plants can kind of tell you what they need. A lot of the things you may see um, that are wrong with your plants, if you kind of studied, you know, what the nutrient deficiencies look like, it may really help. You know, if one thing, nitrogen, plants just tend to grow slow and be undersized. Phosphorus, you won't get blooms. Common thing with tomatoes here is that you get really big plants, but you don't get a lot of blooms. And that could be because you have too much nitrogen, not enough phosphorus. Uh, stunted growth. Um, plants that are, don't get enough potassium are kind of spindly and don't grow to full size. Um, uh, you can look at leaves for other clues. Uh, potassium shortage um, can leave the yellows kind of burned and yellow on the tip. Phosphorus uh, can turn things dark purple. Um, the leaves kind of purplish and uh, nitrogen, you know, a lot of times you get a change to yellow leaves because you don't have enough nitrogen. But a lot of times these soil new these uh, deficiency could be from overwatering or the monsoons, uh, which overwater for us because it dilutes the, the nutrients. And so you might want to look at that as a possibility. I had a problem with my peppers last year that apparently the soil wasn't draining uh, properly and they were turning yellow. And um, so, you know, some worm castings and some and cutting back on the water and adding some sand to the soil and we got it fixed. Um, another issue that comes up as a deficiency for us, which is weird, uh, is a calcium deficiency, which is shows up in tomatoes as blossom end rot, which is kind of weird for me because I have limestone in my soil, which is calcium carbonate in part, and you think there's plenty of calcium. But a lot of times I do seem to get some blossom end rot at the beginning of the season, and I add a little bit of bone meal, and it usually goes away but it's probably got something to do with the pH and the um, calcium being locked up and not being, and plants not being able to access it. Uh, next slide. All right, composting. Uh, my, my first love, my wife gave me this sign, says compost, proof that there is life after death. Um, how to turn garden and food waste into black gold. Next slide. Composting is a natural way of recycling the organic matter, such as leaves, food scraps, um, other organic matter, and turning it into a, va a valuable uh, food, uh, soil additive. And I think of it more as an amendment, but it does, because it's kind of mild in all the nutrients, but it really does help with more uh, um, soil organisms and all the things that you would get from adding compost to the soil, drainage, water retention, depending on what you need. So interestingly enough, America wastes about 40% of the food it produces, which is about one and a half pounds per person per day. Um, American households waste about 40% of the food they purchase. We've all had our experiences with that. The thing about farms wasting food in the field, you know what a celery, a bunch of celery looks like when you buy it in the grocery store, but celery when it grows in the field is about two times, three times that big, bigger much more, much wider in diameter. And uh, when they harvest it, they just cut off all those outside uh, stalks and get it not quite as small as what they what we end up with, but, and they just leave that celery in the field. And some food banks will glean it, but having worked in a food bank, there's plenty of celery around. 
And so pr pretty much it just ends up getting plowed in as organic matter, but it does seem kind of a waste. Next slide. What is compost? It's a soil like material. It's not soil. It doesn't have all those, it doesn't have that mineral component. Um, it's full of nutrients and they're in a form that's really easy to absorb. It's also full of microorganisms that are processing the organic matter in the compost. And when they go into your soil, they'll continue to process what's in your soil and um, help your plants. And um, they are mostly beneficial microorganisms. Next slide. What happens during composting? Well, aerobic, oxygen-loving microorganisms consume organic matter, breaking it down into a more usable form for plants. While these microorganisms are consuming the organic matter, they release enzymes into the compost. Those start chemical reactions that then become and makes the compost hotter. As the bacteria, um, as the compost heats up, bacteria that like really high temperatures will start to reproduce and will take over the process. These are called thermophilic bacteria and they can eat compost up to 150 is common, but I've heard attempts as high as 180. Um, next slide. Little diagram of how composting works. Organic matter goes in, water, oxygen go in, microorganisms do the work. Water, CO2 and heat are released, but it's not enough CO2 to be a problem because this stuff was going to break down somewhere and this is the best case scenario. Organic matter comes out on the other side, including hummus and um, the microorganisms also come out on the other side. Next slide. What are some of the benefits of composting? Well, we've already discussed some of them. It might reduce the need for chemical fertilizers. It enriches the soil, helping retain moisture and can suppress plant diseases and pests. That's both a combination of the organic matter, but really the microorganisms. Um, it encourages the production of more beneficial microorganisms and uh, reduces waste from going into the landfill where they take up space and release methane. Um, interesting, you know, in Flagstaff, we have all these bags of pine needles that go into the landfill, which are brown. We have all these bags of food waste that go into the landfill, which are green, but they can interact because they're not mixed and they're separated. And it's a shame. And then about 20% of all the greenhouse gases produced by the city of Flagstaff is from the landfill. Um, composting is fun. And even though it's not approved as a weight loss program, you may find you'll lose some weight because it's a lot of work. Next slide. Steps for composting. I'm going to show this slide a couple of times. The first thing we're going to do is selecting material for your compost, organic based material. But let's go through the list. Selecting a container and a location, very important. Proper ventilation, super important to keep that oxygen flowing. Getting the proper moisture level ready. Um, so the um, moisture level, we say damp is a wet sponge. In Flagstaff these days, it's been very difficult to keep it wet enough. I've never had problems because normally I'd have a lot more vegetable matter. I'll talk about that in a few minutes, but um, it's just been so dry it's been drying out. You kind of, even between turns, you need to be adding some moisture. Um, show you the importance. Nancy and I started gardening back, I don't know, 30 years ago, and we did, didn't stay with it very long. We quit that time. And then a few years later, we started back up and I went to get the old compost bin and I uncovered the compost bin. And you could still recognize some of the cauliflower florets and broccoli after like three years. I think they were sort of freeze dry, but there was no moisture, so they didn't break down. Maintain desired temperature, just a monitoring effect. We'll talk about that. Cure, curing finished compost. We'll get into that and straining. Next slide. So we're going to go into a bit of detail on what we're going to do to add into our, our, com our compost. We need to create a carbon nitrogen balance because that's what the microorganisms want. And um, all organic matter, matter has a carbon nitrogen ratio expressed as CN. And high carbon browns are called, high carbon organic matters called browns. High nitrogen are called greens. The ideal ratio for compost is somewhere around 30 to one. I've seen estimates from 25 to 40 to one. You're not gonna hit it exact, but you're, you're kind of aiming in that area. Um, high carbon browns can range from 60 to one to 400 to one. It's a huge range. And nitrogen, high nitrogen greens 
can be from about seven to one to 40 to one, not a very wide margin. And you're basically gonna be averaging the greens and the browns. It's not gonna be an exact average, but you give you an idea. You can't get an exact average without knowing the mass and the water content of each. And that would be way too intellectual for making compost, I think. Next slide. And here's a, uh, a, a um, schedule of different um, uh, carbon and nitrogen ratios. Wood chips are really high in carbon. You will need a lot of nitrogen to go with that. Also, wood chips take about two years to break down. Uh, sawdust and cardboard are also very high in carbon. I use some cardboard. Um, I'll show you that later on, but not really as an additive, more as a insulator. Um, newspaper is not too bad. Um, and they use a good ink at uh, the Daily Sun. Kind of avoid the colored ink if you can. Straw, I'm a big fan of, 75 to 1, not too bad. Dried deciduous leaves are really good because they're, they break down fast and they're not too high in carbon. And pine straw, 110 to 1, but I'm kind of obsessed with it because I have a lot of it. Um, nitrogen rich greens. So I got into this from the restaurant, um, composting food waste. And I could take on as much as 30 gallons a week because we did everything from scratch. So we had lots of, you know, lettuce ends and coffee grounds and um, celery ends and stuff. But anyway, so then I was getting it from the food bank for a long time. But I don't know if you've, you've I'm sure you've seen the lines at food banks and on TV. There's just so much demand for food. that They're not really having any farm food left over. What they would do in the past was the food that was too bad to give to people, they would put out for farmers. And um, it's been very difficult to get, and I don't want to take anything away from people that need it. So haven't really had much food waste um, this year. Every once in a while, I'll find a little bit over there. But um, I've been using alfalfa hay a lot. Alfalfa hay, it's got to be green and fresh. But anyway, it's very high in nitrogen. Um, I also use coffee grounds, which you can get from coffee shops. Beer mash, I've used a lot in the past, but most of the breweries have a contract with somebody to pick up their beer mash. So it's not as easy to get as it used to be. If you have chickens or horses, you know, manure will really help to heat up your compost. I always find that people that have chickens say, wow, it's really easy to heat up your compost. And those of us that don't have chicken manure find it a little harder. But the one thing about, you don't really wanna bring manure in from somebody else's area because it very likely could have some weed seeds that you don't have already. So it could create some new problems for you. It also basically increases the pot potential for having more pathogens. Next slide. Example of combining browns and greens. So if we take our example of straw at 75 to one and green and vegetables at 25 to one, and you do a combination, a common recipe is two parts brown to one part green. Some people do three parts brown to one part green, but you can see it two parts. To two to one that you're gonna have, that the average is gonna be way above 30 to one. And so the way you can deal with that is by using hot greens. And those are uh, some of the uh, nitrogen rich ma materials that are very high in nitrogen. We mentioned some of them, beer mash, cornmeal, we didn't mention because you have to buy that. Um, alfalfa meal, that'd be like buying rabbit food. Blood meal, it's pretty expensive, $18 for a two pound bag. Livestock manure we mentioned and alfalfa hay. I have really found the alfalfa hay is to kept my um, compost bin hot all winter, even when we had some really cold days. Occasionally I covered it, but most uh, put an extra cover on it, but mostly it just stayed hot. Next slide. So let's look at hot composting versus cool composting. So what we think of a lot of the benefits we get from compost comes from hot composting. And we would consider 110 to 155 degrees to be hot composting. But really, you kind of need to main about, maintain about 135 if you want to destroy um, pathogens, uh, weed seeds, and uh, insect larvae. <clears throat> and keeping it to 135 is pretty good work, pretty good amount of work. But if you can keep it hot, it'll break down much faster, requires more nitrogen and more oxygen, and it's labor intensive. You have to turn it pretty often to keep it um, at that, that level. Cool composting, one book I have calls it comfort composting, um, is what most people in the country do, actually. 
Um, and it might run between 85 and 105. It could be cooler than 85. It's just gonna take a very long time to break down. It takes more like six months to a year to break down. It's not gonna kill the weed seeds and the um, insect larvae and stuff, but it will break down and it will um, eventually make um, good finished compost. Next slide. What not to compost? Coal or charcoal ash, uh, dairy products, diseased insect ridden plants. So, you know, common thing here is for us to get powdery mildew, you know, on squash plants and cucumbers. You don't want to put those in your compost pile. Fats, grease, lards, all those are going to smell. They're also going to attract rodents, meat and fish bone scraps. You know, they're going to smell and attract rodents. Pet waste, yard trimmings treated with chemical pesticides. Um, oh, I didn't mention it, but um, grass clippings are really a good green. Um, and I think uh, Flagstaff Ranches still does their golf course without any pesticide. I haven't ever gone out there to pick it up, but I'm told it's a, something they want you to do. They want to get, they want them to get used. Next slide. Uh, back to our steps for composting. Let's talk about, this time we're going to talk about selecting a container in a proper location. And so let's go ahead and jump ahead to that. Next slide. So this is called an earth machine. This is literally 30 years old. The first time we started gardening, we got this from an Earth Day celebration. They're really practical. Um, so the, it doesn't have a bottom to it. So it's in contact, the compost will be in contact with the ground, which helps keep it warm and also gives it access um, to more microorganisms. And the way you use this is when you, you fill it up, and then after when you're ready to turn it, you pick the whole plastic bin up, move it over, set it down beside it, and then you shovel the compost into the back into the bin, and that's the that turns it. Um, it's really hard to stir inside the compost bin. I learned that the hard way. Next uh, slide. The earth machines do break in half. Um, when they're new, they're pretty easy to take apart and put back together. Um, after 30 years, this one's not staying together very well. So it's actually up on my deck so I could screw the two halves together. But the advantage of being able to break it in the middle is that you don't have to shovel as high to get uh, the compost back into the bin when you're, when you're working it. Um, but after a while, it gets to where they, uh, they just won't stay together. And I was afraid things would fall out and, you know, would attract animals that might push it, up, push it over. Next bin. These are some uh, examples of homemade bins. Um, the one on the left is made out of pallets. The one in the middle looks like it's made out of wire. I did see an interesting one like that made out of like an old kitchen mat, which had a lot of holes in it, sort of made a, um, was a little bit more contained than this one, uh, worked pretty well and the other one's made out of blocks. The only thing about all these is I think you have to cover them. They're too exposed. They're gonna dry out really badly in the, in the hot days. And when it rains or snows, they're going to get saturated and be too wet. Next slide. Uh, this is a homemade three compartment bin. The three compartment bin is a really cool thing. Um, this is uh, Judy. Um, I, I volunteer with her at um, the Olivia White Hospice Garden and her husband built this for her. And so the idea is you'd fill, you put your compost in one bin and you'd fill it, keep adding to it. When it gets to a certain point, you would shovel it into the next bin and then you could start a new bin. And then when it gets, you know, almost done, you shovel it into the last bin for it to cure. And so, and um, so it does enforce the need that we kind of need to have more than one compost bin. Because if you have one compost bin, then at some point you've got to stop adding stuff to it. And then what do you do with the stuff that you accumulate in the meantime? But um, this works out really well. I have multiple compost bins, or you could just start a pile with one of them with your, your next batch of stuff. Next slide. Proper ventilation for composting. You really need the, the uh, bacteria to stay aerobic and the pile to stay aerobic. If it goes anaerobic, it will start producing methane gas, which is a potent greenhouse gas. And it also will smell really bad and your neighbors won't be very happy. One of the ways we add ventilation is there's vents on the side of compost bins, or if you're covering it with plastic, you can poke holes in it. Um, I also like to put a vent pipe 
whether I'm using a pile, whatever kind of container, I'll put a vent pipe in the middle. In the winter, I can make sure the vent pipe stays inside so it's getting um, a warm air exchange as opposed to bringing cold air in the middle. Uh, loose ingredients like straw and hay help to create uh, pores and air spaces sort of in the same way um, that the, the aggregates create pores in the, in the soil. Turning compost to expose it uh, to fresh air is the most important manner. And the more often you turn it, the more air it's going to be, the fresher it's going to smell, and the faster it's going to compost. Next slide. This is a different kind of a, uh, a compost bin. I think this one got retired from manufacturer. It completely had fallen apart at all the seams, but I've screwed it back together. And it's again open on the bottom. And uh, if uh, let's go to the next slide. And this is the same compost pile, but I took the bin off. And now you can see there's a vent pipe in the middle. You can obviously tell that it's pine needle compost. And um, but anyway, that's just to show how the vent pipe works. Next slide. So bin composting versus doing a, a compost pile. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that we say the compost should be about a cubic yard. A compost pile should be about a cubic yard. None of the commercial bins are that big. Um, bins are more attractive, but like I say, they're smaller. So that means you probably have to work it a little bit harder. Uh, purchasing, purchasing a bin can be more expensive, but commercial bins, um, but you can also make your own bins. Upright bins get better airflow. Bins are open on the bottom or still in contact with the earth. Turning compost with uh, a bin is more labor intensive. Compost in a pile. Uh, as lower profiles, there's more contact um, with the earth. You do still need to keep it covered. I've switched from plastic to tarps because the plastic breaks down so fast. Um, turning the compost will be easier because you can kind of rake it off the top. And uh, I think it gets less airflow for the most part. I do still use vent pipes in the middle. I do poke holes in the, the tarp, but I think you get a little bit less airflow. Next slide. If you look at this uh, pile, you can kind of tell that if you just got to one side of it with a hoe or a rake, you can kind of just pull it over. So you can kind of just rake it to one side and then rake it back. You might not have to do so, nearly as much shoveling as you do in a compost bin. Um, this one was a, a kind of struggling compost pile. I added extra stuff to it and stopped cooking altogether. Then it froze. And so I spread it out um, and was trying to get it to heat back up. Next slide. And then I insulated it with cardboard. Next slide. And then I covered with black plastic and weighted it down. Next slide. And then it got covered with three feet of snow. This was the big record breaking snow uh, three years ago, I guess it was. Um, and uh, so you might know you're a compost nerd if you're still temping your compost when there's a lot of snow on the ground. Uh, it says the compost thermometer reads 58. Compost thermometers are about 18 inches long and they sort of read along their whole length. So the fact that this one's saying 58 and you can be pretty sure the outside is 32 degrees, the inside is probably maybe about 70 or 80. So it's still going and it didn't freeze. So that was a plus. Um, again, you know, monitoring um, to see how it's done, how, how far along your compost has come. One of those things is um, using a compost thermometer to check the heat. Another thing, if you don't have a compost thermometer, you know, you can use your bare hand or a gloved hand even, and you can see how hot the center is. Um, and also the aroma, keeping a track of the aroma while you're checking the moisture in the air it starts to smell, you know, ammonia-like, or it should have a nice earthy smell, then you might need to be adding some more carbon or um, turning it. Next slide. Curing compost. So once you, and I have a whole um, slide about kind of how the life I think a compost pile might go for you. But um, curing is the next to last step. And not everybody talks about curing, but if you have hot compost, then some microorganisms can't survive in hot compost and worms don't like hot compost, you know, are not gonna like 135 degrees. So you spread it out. Once it starts to cool down, you spread it out, put something permeable on the outside like straw or burlap or something, 
and allow it to slowly finish. Oh, it takes about another month and it'll break down. It'll go down in size again by about another half and it will complete, help to complete the process. Um, at the end, if you want to test it to see if it's done, I always put it in a Ziploc bag and seal it up. Wait, you know, a few days to a week. And if it's not done, it will definitely smell like ammonia. Next uh, slide. Uh, the finished product, we probably want to, and we hope it's going to be dark and crumbly. You have to get it to the right degree of dryness to be able to strain it easily. If it's too wet, it won't strain very well. If it's too dry, you've killed a lot of your microorganisms. Um, and straining it is really helpful depending on how much stuff you have in it, how much chunks can be necessary. A lot of times, like in the fall, when I'm going to put compost, on and I know it's going to sit on the top of the ground all winter with mulch on it, I might leave it kind of chunky and let it break down on the bed. And then in this spring, I'll rake some of the bigger pieces out. Uh, next slide. Some potential problems. It smells like ammonia. It's either too much nitrogen, it's not getting enough air is probably the most likely problem. And if it's too wet, then it won't uh, be able to get enough air to pass through because then it'll go anaerobic. Not breaking down is probably too much carbon, not enough green or not enough hot greens, um, or it's too dry. Um, might very well need water um, or more oxygen, so it needs to be turned. Turning is kind of a cure-all for everything, and you get to really look at it and see it and see what's going on. Not getting hot, high nitrogen greens, turn more often and make sure it's wet enough. Uh, winter, um, add hotter green material. Um, manure, alfalfa, we've discussed that. Make sure pile is in a sunny spot. It'll stay warmer if it's in contact with the ground. I did double cover mine a few times when the temp went down to like 10 degrees. And um, I also used warm water to moisten it to help keep from cooling it off. You know, if you have to break the ice, I have a big container of water out near my compost pile. If I have to break the ice of it, off of it, it's probably going to slow things down a bit. Next slide. The life and times of a compost pile. So basically, I'm start, just to give you a little bit of an idea how it heats up. We won't go through it exactly. Um, you layer your compost into your bin. It's two parts brown straw and one part green alfalfa, hay, and vegetables. You make sure every layer is wet. You put in a vent pipe and you cover it. And in a couple of days, it'll take at least a couple of days, sometimes as much as four days um, to heat up. It'll heat up faster if you have active compost you can add to help get the microorganisms started. Uh, when the temp starts to go back down, maybe it might be a week to 10 days, um, I in the compost pile probably shrunk by maybe a third. Then I um, will turn it again. And I usually at that point will add more greens and browns, especially with a compost bin. If you don't keep adding stuff, you're going to end up you know, with a fraction of the size you want. Um, add water as needed. Pile will take two days to heat up again, wait another 10 days or so, let it shrink again, add more um, browns and greens. Keep uh, turning and adding more stuff for maybe a month to a month and a half, kind of depending on how it's looked, how hot it's staying. After um, about a month and a half, I just start turning, I stop adding new materials and I just start turning it only. And I keep checking the water, keep turning it for maybe two or three more weeks. And then we start to check to see, you know, you'll get to a point where it won't heat up anymore. And that's because enough stuff is broken down that there's not enough fresh nitrogen to carry the rest of the pile. So when it starts to cool down close to uh, ambient air temperature, then I think about really looking through it to look to see if most of the greens have turned black. If not, I might let it go a little bit longer, even though it's really slowing down. And once I think it's really done, because the black, the, the, um, most of the greens um, are black and the browns have turned, you know, a darker brown and started to break down into smaller pieces. And then I put it on the cure, spread it out, cover it with burlap or straw and cure for about one month, turning occasionally and then strain. Next uh, slide. Oh, pine needles. How I learned to love pine needles. Um, it's kind of a love-hate relationship in some respects, but I'm a little obsessed. Next slide. 
we um, we have lots of pine needles. I've got 16 pond rows of pines in my yard. Next slide. This is my neighbor's pine needles. So he's doing his, ended up filling a lot of the landfill with pine needles in plastic bags. Next slide. So there's some special techniques required for composting pine needles. If you go on the internet, it's going to say they're really acidic. Don't use them. Or if you do use them, only use them for about 10% of your compost. I've been using them as my sole brown in a lot of piles for a long time. And my soil still is on the alkaline side. Um, I also worked with somebody on pine needle composting from the University of Washington or Washington State University. And um, they said that they had done two years with a grant experimenting with it. And they said that their finished pine needle compost was uh, about 6.5 on the pH scale. And so you're going to grind or crush. Oh, pine needles have a, a waterproof cuticle on the outside. That waterproof cuticle will really slow them down, breaking down. And you can compost whole pine needles. They take a long time, six months to a year. And they're probably still going to look like whole pine needles, but they'll probably break down when you strain them. Um, so it's good to either grind them, crush them, and drive over them with a car. I use a lawnmower to break them up. Um, it's also good to age them. So it works out really well that I put them on my beds as mulch in the fall, and then I start composting them in the spring. I like to pre-soak them. Pine needles are super dry because of that cuticle, and they're very resistant still to absorbing water. Put them in a five-gallon bucket, fill it up with water. After one day, they're pretty wet. After three days, all the water is gone. And you can see this little white um, at the end of the pine needle where it started to bloat. Uh, Pre-mixing browns and greens is another way to put a, a compost pile together. It's not a bad idea. It's more work. Um, I don't really do it anymore. Hot composting techniques are certainly helpful. Next slide. So this is a pile of pine needles in my lawnmower, which I got for free. But now I put a couple hundred dollars into it. So I don't know if it was such a good deal after all. Um, you know, lawnmowers are kind of a um, endangered species these days because people are doing native plants and they're doing zero scaping. And so not a lot of people need lawnmowers, but everybody has one in their garage. Next slide. That's after I've run over them two or three times and they're pretty broken up. There'll always still be a few whole pine needles. That's why you have to strain pine needle compost for sure. Next slide. There they are soaking in their five gallon buckets. Next slide. And this is pre-mixing uh, some greens with some pine needles um, before I put them in the compost pile. Um, looks like a pine needle salad. Next slide. OK. I might be going too fast here. Um, vermicomposting, or how I learned to love worms. And I really do love the worms. That's not a love-hate relationship. They've been great for us. I tell you, you know, compost, I think, makes sort of a soil amendment. Um, you're at a good way to add organic matter to your soil, and it does add nutrients on sort of a mild level. But vermicompost verma or uh, worm castings are more like a strong fertilizer, really rich in nitrogen. Um, usually we do California red wigglers, though there are some people, you know, using some other kinds of worms. Earthworms are not good. Earthworms eat, eat the soil, including some of the mineral stuff. So they're not so good in uh, um, just a brown bedding. Uh, organic matter and other organic matters. And um, so anyway, we're going to keep them in a special container called a wormery or a compost bin in my case. Uh, as with regular composting, we do need browns and greens. The bedding is the brown, which is high in carbon, and the nitrogen is some kind of vegetable matter. And they're kind of picky eaters. We feed them lettuce and um, cornmeal and carrots, and um, but they don't eat mushrooms. They they don't eat um, onions. They don't eat garlic. They don't eat cabbage family crops very well. You may have some different experiences, but that's been my experience. Um, and so. <clears throat> anyway, next slide. These are our compost bins. They're 10 gallon totes. I get them at Home Depot and um, I drill holes in them. You drill big holes um, up high and I drill really tiny holes down low to let carbon dioxide escape. And then there's also holes in the top. So I also put a piece of brown paper over the top um, to, to help keep it dark even 
because of the air holes. Um, you also can buy worm towers. They're you know kind of expensive, I think. Um, they do need a constant um, temperature. They need not to be jiggled around too much. So if you thought, well, they'd stay nice and warm on top of my dryer, they're not going to be happy. They're going to have nervous, a nervous wreck. Um, it does need to stay moist, but they have a, more of a tendency to get too wet, but you do kind of need to get it up to a level of moisture like the damp is a wet sponge. The worms produce a lot of moisture. Um, it will get really wet over time and that moisture will seep to the bottom. It's called leachate. leachate. Some people think it's worm tea. I don't believe it is worm tea. I believe it is uncomposted worm pee essentially. And I don't think it's a good thing you want to make worm tea, you need to take some of your worm castings, put them in a five gallon bucket with rainwater and an aerator and maybe a little bit of molasses. And then you can make some really good worm tea, um, which people use for a lot of different things. Um, for um, I haven't done it yet. I keep thinking every day I'm going to start some, but I haven't done it yet. Um, we use cocoa fiber for bedding. Newspaper is also good. Um, compost can be used. And like I said, the compost will get a whole lot stronger. Avocado husks and banana peels are kind of good for getting them to lay eggs. If you put an avocado husk um, with the open side down, the worms will gather into it and they will lay a ton of eggs on the inside layer of that little bit of avocado on the inside. And uh, when you pick it up a few days later, there's like, you know, tons of eggs and tons of worms in the um, in, underneath the avocado husk. Um, a bit of coffee grounds uh, will help. You can also put the filters in. Uh, next slide. Oh, the best way to harvest the worm castings, and we don't let it go till there's just nothing in the bin except for worm and worms and castings. It just they get really anxious and try to escape when it gets too wet, and so we take it out after about three months, probably maybe half worm castings and half bedding. Um, so anyway, what we do is you take a, 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 the same kind of bin that fits tightly so there's no light getting in, drill holes in the bottom of it, set it on top of the worm, uh, on the worm bedding, then you fill it with a clean, uh, moist bedding and put food on top. And as the worms finish the bedding in the lower bin, they will move up through the holes and take up residence in the higher bin and you keep adding food to that bin and then you can pretty much harvest all of the, the the worm castings in the bottom bin, but you still might have to pick through them a little bit. Um, it, um, my wife likes to go through the final stages. She uses a fork and picks out the last few worms individually and puts them in a new bin. You can add the worms into your garden bed, but they need organic matter. So you really do need to make sure you're keeping a lot of organic matter in your uh, garden beds if you put the worms out in your garden bed. You can put them in your compost bin. You know, they will escape the heat. Um, and, but then, you know, you're gonna have a lot of worms in your bin, which is a little harder to strain with a lot of worms, but you can, um, you know, I know one of the master gardeners, Chris Wells, she keeps a lot of uh, red, red wigglers in her composting bin and it works really well for her. Um, next bin or next slide. And this is the volcano method for harvesting uh, worm compost. And this was actually compost. You can tell it's still pine, pine needles and straw in it. Um, so you, you build these little volcanoes out of the worm bedding and you put a pretty bright light on it and the worms don't like the light. So they'll go down to the bottom of the pile and then you can kind of pick the worm bedding off the top. And eventually you get down to where you, there's just a, a lot of worms and very little bedding. And then you'll have to put that into a new bin um takes about maybe half an hour for them to move and then you know if once you've gotten the first batch you can combine the, the piles um and you know to make it thicker and keep it, taking the the worm castings off the top um okay next slide end of slideshow okay All right. Well, thank you so much, Frank, for sharing all of your knowledge on composting and soil. So Frank wanted me to thank his wife, Nancy, who helped him create those beautiful slides 
and um, kept both of us on schedule, both Frank and I. She's kind of the coordinator and the boss of this whole project. So thank you so much to Nancy. Maybe she can someday get an honorary um, master gardener title, just like uh, Jackie Alston's husband. <laughs> So um, yeah, throwing that out there. Um, we still have some time left and I know that um, Hattie's been checking the chat and answering your questions, but we can um, definitely open it up to more Q and A if we want. We have a pretty manageable um, group tonight. There's only 32 people. So if um, people wanted to unmute themselves and ask, Frank, any questions, um, I think that we could definitely do that. First of all, can I say one thing, Gail? I yeah. want to thank you also for supplying me with a lot of those slides and helping put this together as well. So you and Nancy really helped. I just talk. I, I don't do all the technical stuff. <laughs> well, since you said that, then I'm going to thank Hattie because I, <laughs> she probably <laughs> recognized some of those slides. Slide. But yes, I did do some of them. <laughs> and um, Ellen Ryan, who um, teaches our composting class for the Master Gardener class, some of those were her slides as well. So okay. we all learn from each other and we all share. I have to say that I just, <clears throat> I feel like I have the best Master Gardener student now. He listened. Yes, and he learned. Thank you, Frank. That was a great presentation. Thank and you. I think it was way more interesting than mine. So anyway, Yours. but thanks. You, when you told me about soil structure, I'm like, my soil is a solid block. How can it be structured to it? <laughs> but now it's not like that anymore. Well, we do have somebody that asks, why don't you put ashes from your wood stove in your compost? They tend to be alkaline. And they could have some um, other chemicals in them, but mostly I think it's the alkalinity. Um, and then I think there might be some off ingredients as well. So I think, you know, you can add one little layer, but if you have a three foot tall compost bin, you're not going to get rid of all your wood ashes in your compost bin, but it has, you know, it has potassium and some nutrients. So there are a lot of um, composting publications that say add them, but if you're back in Pennsylvania where the soil pH is 5.8, it might be a better situation, but we're not in Pennsylvania. We're in Arizona. We have a question from Lauren. Hi. Actually from Mark. Well, I had a question <laughs> about the, so we do a little worm composting and I was curious you sound like you had the worm composting and the, and the hot composting and stuff. It kind of looked like from the pictures, you probably got a lot more compost from the hot composting and stuff. Is that right? Or do you, could you get like pretty, com, pretty decent amounts from worm composting? Like that? Well, I think you, you'd have a hard time making as much. Of course, the hot composting also means you have to, um, you have to go out and gather some of those materials probably. I mean, depending on how big your family is. I mean, I produce about a five gallon bucket of, of, of food product and I buy some uh, alfalfa hay and I get about four bins out of a bale of alfalfa hay. Um, and I use pine needles, which I have more than enough of. And when I don't have pine needles because they're mulching my gardens, I use straw. You know, the food bank is gonna come back as a good source for food matter. Um, and if you either brew beer or know anybody who brews beer, or you just are a regular at a bar that brews beer, you know, uh, the, uh, the grains work really well. Um, one of the tricks with the grains is they stick together pretty bad. So it's good to kind of maybe rinse them a bit and, uh, loosen them up in some water. But, um, yeah, it takes a lot of stuff. I mean, if, uh, you know, I took, I think two buckets of vegetable matter and, and two buckets of hay and, and five gallons of coffee grounds and to Olivia White the other day, we only filled the bin halfway full. You know, we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of dried stuff that we grind up there, so it does take a lot of stuff, but you can make a whole lot more. Um, and for me, I don't know what do you feed your worms. Pretty much 
all the vegetables and fruit that we have, and then I'll mix in some leaves and pine needles. I, I never tried crushing up the pine needles. I noticed they never decompose, but now I'm going to do that. Um, yeah, break helps if they uh, if you can ex break and expose more surface area besides the cuticle. Yeah, and I've seen. You don't have any problem with them eating cabbage and stuff? Um, no, I think most anything we've put in there, they've eaten uh, with it. I mean, there've been a few. I have seen, I think, a, a cabbage. Um, like the interior yeah, they can eat big the cabbage, but the, uh, they, we put in, they seem to really like watermelon. Uh, yeah, they like fruit. They like melons. That's true. Yeah. Corn, corn and, and corn husks, they go, anytime I take a corn husk out and you pop it open there, it's full of worms. And so yeah. that's been good, but yeah, it's, they seem to be, I mean, they pretty much will take any of the vegetables. We'll take pretty much all our vegetable and fruit scraps and that's all that we won't put any meat or any eggs or in it or anything just to just keep it with vegetables and fruits. And it seemed to be, Seems to work pretty well. We we now have three bins. We started with one, but we just kept kind of. Oh, cool. You're doing all the California red wigglers. I think, I think right. so. We yeah. got them from a friend too. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Yeah, and then they multiply like crazy, so you can just make another bin and just. We had to move them into the garage because it got so cold outside. But. And we looked it up on the internet the other day, and people were we talked about using a couple of different kind of worms, including night crawlers, which. I kind of grew up with night crawlers, but uh, I didn't know they were compost worms. But um, yeah, I might look into that because uh, from what he said, it they might be a little bit more um, more voracious. I don't know. Cool. So we have a couple questions. Um, we have Christina asked, "Are orange peels okay?" And I wonder if that's for worm composting or your regular compost bin. And I'm not sure if she's still on the call. She is. Well, um, they're not okay for worm composting, but for her regular really. compost. Yeah, people, some, some people have said that don't, not to do citrus, but I have, you know, bought cases of Meyer lemons and juiced them and put all the, all the skins in and they disappeared um, just fine and the compost came out fine. And since our soil is alkaline, it's probably not going to hurt too much. So, I, you know, I think the point is, is that in a regular compost bin, it's not the worms that are doing the work, it's the microorganisms. and. But I think anytime you overdo anything. So if Frank got like 12 cases of grapefruit <laughs> that were rotting and he threw them in his compost bin, that might not okay. work. <laughs> I don't think that's gonna work. Yeah, you're but right. for me, you know, when I cut up, I cut the grapefruit up into like eight pieces or the rinds and, you know, and, it, and then there's all kinds of other stuff. And so I don't think that's a problem, but it's, you know, anytime you, you, well, you know, you overdo anything, it's gonna be a problem. Um, we have Shannon asked, how should you prepare a soil for a perennial like asparagus? That is a great question. Well, it likes a more uh, uh, alkaline soil, so you don't have to add any. Um, and, you know, some of the, like I said, some of the Kellogg stuff, I don't, um, I put a lot of compost in. I, I have an asparagus bed. It did come back uh, the, the, the second year. Hopefully it's going to come back this year. Um, but I put um, a lot of compost in it. And I was careful not to put anything acidic in it. Um, and it seemed to be fine. They seemed to like a lot of compost. Um, I mulch it really heavy in the, in the winter. And I don't know if specific nutrients they might need. I probably should look that up. Mm -hmm. Oh, orange. So I, I think um, when we're working with vegetable gardens that you, you, can you can dig up every single year. And so you have a chance to correct your mistakes um, and you can put stuff in in the fall. And then if you forgot or there's a snowstorm, you can put stuff in the spring. But anytime you're creating a perennial bed, you need to like spend more time and energy putting in working on the soil than you would actually for your asparagus. And this is true for like shrubs and perennial flowers and things like that. 
because it's your chance. And so with asparagus, it really means working that soil and making a good soil and making it deep and adding a lot of organic matter and, but you know, not stuff that's going to make it acidic. And I think some of us think that there's a magic potion that we can sprinkle around to help fix that heavy clayey soil. No, you just got to dig it up. <laughs> you don't want to dig, dig it up, hire somebody to dig it up. <laughs> And so this person says, for asparagus, should we use more of a mineral soil base since we have soils where we live where the parent material is limestone? I think that should be good. I mean, that's what I have. And uh, I think just put a lot of compost in. And I don't know if you've researched the planting of asparagus. I tried three different methods. The one that worked best was you dig like an eight inch trench. You put the uh, bare roots in and you put only about two inches of soil on them and then you let them come up. And once they break out of the soil, you put two more inches of soil. But some people said bury them a foot deep. Some people said bury them six inches deep. Those were much longer to come up and we're not any healthier than the ones that I just kind of brought the soil up as they grew. But that's the best one I found. <clears throat> We have one more question. If the pine needles are old, do you still want, do you still need to crush them for compost? It's a little bit optional. Um, Hattie did, uh, you know, that was one of the things that I didn't quite understand with my, my contact from Washington State. He said that it worked fine. It was just, it was kind of confused. I couldn't quite sort out what he was saying, but he kind of indicated that if they were a year old, you didn't need to crush them and that they would break down. They will still take longer to break down, but they will they will compost okay if they're like a year old. I think that the cuticle eventually washes off or breaks down just from aging. I did, I made it, well, I don't know, it might've been a discovery. I was going on vacation and I ground a bunch of pine needles and I put them on the soak and then I realized I didn't have time to make the pile. So I left them in my garage for 10 days soaking. And I think those broke down really fast. But I'm not sure I'm going to include 10 days in my in my normal procedures. So we have one more question that I see. And this is a really common master gardener question. Not that she lives in Cheshire, but she lives in Cheshire and has a tiny yard. And so there's lots of people that have a tiny yard and my earth machine is dying, falling apart. What composter do you recommend? Are there any? <laughs> good question. You know, I, I'd probably buy a new earth machine. Um, you know, we had to replace some at uh, Olivia White and we ordered two more uh, earth machines and they've done really well. Um, you know, there's a lot, I didn't show a picture of the ones that kind of turn, that spin, you know, they, that, uh, they're horizontal and they're not in contact with the earth and, but I had one once and, um, they get really heavy after a while. And so it gets kind of hard to turn. Um, I probably would think about an earth machine. I, I can't think of anyone that I've seen that looks superior to it. Um, and they look attractive for me. Don't people don't even have to know that there's compost in them. Oh, great. Thanks, Frank. You're welcome. Thank you. It's time for a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, if um, nobody else has any questions, we can let Frank go enjoy his glass or two of wine. <laughs> um, for next week, we have Coconino County Master Gardener, Jackie Alston, who is going to be presenting on season extension, what it, which is really, really important to us at the higher elevations of Northern Arizona. And then um, for our very last class, we'll have Hattie presenting on plant problems. And we also have a, another special guest speaker, um, Coconino County Master Gardener, 
Cindy Murray, who you probably all recognize if you read the Arizona Daily Sun because she contributes to the gardening, et cetera, column a lot. And she is going to give a brief presentation on how she has figured out how to keep um, pocket gophers out of her garden. So some exciting stuff coming up next. Um, <laughs> Thanks everybody for tuning in and I will be sending out the link for next week's class um, by the end of the week. So with that, if nobody else needs anything from us, we're, we'll let everyone go. All right, thank you. Well, thanks Frank, great job. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, good night everyone. It was great. Good night, good night everybody. Thank you. I'm gonna leave, but...